This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. How we doing? Oh, you know. Um, do you want to jump right into it, or do you want to just make a beeline? So here's the thing. <laughs> to the House Republicans. I'll cover it quickly, because okay. we've decided that if I talk about this thing too much, it's going to make me too mad. I think you've already ruined this entire it's episode. It's going to ruin the podcast. There's this thing called Ohio House Bill number 327, introduced by a bunch of not great politicians who are introducing this legislation to ban the teaching of quote, divisive concepts, end quote. Basically, that means we're not allowed to teach anything like there are inherent structures of racism or sexism in this country Mm -hmm. or other things that make certain kinds of politicians uncomfortable. And you should call your legislators, let them know that this is a bad idea. Yeah. Just going to tell the listeners that that took about three attempts to make it something worth uh, publishing. Yeah, yeah. I I get too angry talking about it. It might sound like we're glossing over it, but (laughs) in fact, this is the only way we can get through it. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm hoping we don't have to do a future episode on this. Yeah, that'd be be nice. At the moment, that's the best that we can do to cover it. Yeah, so registered voters in Ohio, go give a look, especially if you're in education, because this will impact you if it passes. It's called House Bill 327. It was introduced last May. It's it's likely still very to, early on yeah. in its life. It's likely to have a very chilling impact on teaching and learning in the state of Ohio if it passes. So go and check out the text of the bill. Maybe get in contact with your legislators. Let them know that it's not a great idea. And uh, that'll be it. That'll be it. That, that's all I'm going to say about that. What if that we just ended the episode right now? And a scene. See you okay. in two weeks. <laughs> well, actually, I'm really excited about this episode. Are you? I... Obviously, this, this is, is your jam. right up my this is alley. This jam. Chelsea, this week, actually chose us to cover the Smithsonian. Yeah. The institution, the museum, all, all of the them. parts of it. Yes. Can we start with one of this? Yeah, why don't you okay. so, do a high-level introduction to the Smithsonian, how, the institution. How much did you know about the Smithsonian Well, before the, the notes, the I research? Mean, uh, just what I've gathered from a, going to Visiting. several of them. Yeah. Did you yeah. know about its creation? I think I had heard... See, I knew nothing. Yeah, I think I had heard parts of the story of okay. the institution's creation, but not that makes not it. in this much detail. Okay. No, there's, so there are I, a lot of twists and turns in the story. I was shocked as yeah. I was researching. I was like, "Did I find a bad link? Like, where did I end up?" Uh huh. Uh-huh. So, if you're not familiar, it kind of reads like a soap opera. Yeah, but better. There's like spice. Yeah, there is some spite, money, some daddy issues. There's, yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot going on. Yeah. So, if you're not familiar with the Smithsonian. You would probably not be super familiar with the Smithsonian if you haven't been to Washington, D.C. to start. That's true. That's not the only place that they exist, but that's the home, okay? So, what is the Smithsonian? It is a group of museums and education and research centers, and it is the largest complex like it in the world. Wow. It's called the Nation's Attic, which I love. The Nation's (laughs) Attic. Okay. Most of it's located in D.C., but they do have other facilities in Maryland, New York, and Virginia. Where is the Air and Space Hangar? That's in Virginia, okay, that's I'm pretty what I sure. That's what I thought. I've not been to the hangar. I've been to that one. It's cool. See, I haven't been to the hangar, and I really want to go to the hangar because that's where the one shuttle is. Yes. The one that they flew across the United States, States on top of another yes. plane. Yes. That's where that is. Yeah. I want to see that. It's pretty cool. Okay. So in total, they have more than 155 million items wow. in their possession. Of those 155 million items, 146 million of them are scientific specimens that are at the National Museum of Natural History. Ooh. So only 9 million items exist outside of the National Museum of Natural History. That's wild. Yeah. I wonder why there's so there are so many more at that one. It's all the animals and stuff. It's like the... Oh, yeah. I know. I mean, I know what they are. It's just sheer volume of objects. It just seems like a lot for that one museum. Well, I mean, you can only keep, you know, so many Oscar the Grouches before you've got them all. Oscar the Grouches. (laughs) Wait, would that be Oscars the Grouch? Oscar the Grouchy? (laughs) Oscar (laughs) Grouchy. Right, right. Okay. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, if you're thinking about the other things the museum has, it would make sense that there'd be so much more in that one. You're right. Okay. I withdraw my... So part of 
So part of the nation's attic includes 19 museums, 21 libraries, nine research centers, a zoo, and then they also have Smithsonian affiliates. And there are 200 institutions and museums in 45 states, and also they're located in Puerto Rico and Panama. Interesting. Didn't know that. The combined visitors of the Smithsonian, 20 million people. A year? More than that a year. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And their federal funding for 20, what was October of 2020 to September of 2021 was a billion dollars. Okay. Good work they're doing. It's a big, uh, it's a big institution. Yeah. Right. So it is 62% federally funded. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, it also has trust and non-federal funds. So that could be like private donors and then all of the revenue from their operations. So they have a really great magazine. They have like shops and restaurants and, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the. Gotta get your chosh keys. Uh, that's where I think we spent all of our money the last time we were there. That's where all of your tchotchkes are from. Every tchotchke you own yeah. from a Smithsonian. Um, I'm, I'm close. looking at a tchotchke from the Smithsonian. Yeah. There's a bear you are. in an astronaut suit <laughs> I hanging have above a you. from the Smithsonian. <laughs> right behind me. Yes, that's true. So in total, their endowment is worth more than $5.4 billion U.S. dollars. And the most important thing about the Smithsonian, they're free to visit. Mm-hmm. So that's why I do you have remember, to go buy yeah, your bear in an astronaut suit when you go, because although they are sixty two percent federally funded, they do require you know what I mean. They do they do need the support. I remember being completely baffled by the idea of a free museum when I went for the first. time. I couldn't time. believe it either. The first time my parents like, took wait, me, where was do like, I buy tickets? What do yeah. I do? We just walked in. And I was yeah. like, "Hello, yeah, where are y'all going? We're going to see Star Spangled Banner." I was like, "Are we?" I don't, don't know. We, don't we have to pay? <laughs> Did we miss this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the way, in that very federally funded way, it's the, it's the people's exhibit. It's it's our, you know. I mean, it's, it's yeah, our it's money for our preservation of our history. So it's uh, it's cool to see it. It's so great. But to work in I that way. I want to go right now, actually. I'm thinking oh, okay. about it. What's your favorite? Ah. Oh. Mine's Air and Space, for sure. So my favorite is American History. I love everything in that museum. You're a nerd. Honestly, what? You're a nerd. You're right. I'm a bigger um, nerd, maybe. One of the times that I went there, I only went because they had the inaugural gowns of the first ladies. Mm-hmm. That was a great exhibit. Mm-hmm. I'm just like going through it in my head. They have that big statue of Washington sitting on top of that chair. That's a great one, too. That's what they originally thought was, never mind. This is going to happen the entire time that we talk about I can this tell. Episode. I can tell. <laughs> I'm so you're excited. Like, you're like bubbling over. <gasps> okay. I'm scared. Okay. My favorite is the American History Museum. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's my favorite. Good. The best by far. I sometimes wish that things would change a little bit quicker in there, but I also understand that they need to keep things out for quite a while for it to, you know what I mean? Yeah. I can't imagine trying to curate those exhibits, Also, the rate that we were going, and I have been to D.C., is alarming. So most people don't consume it as quickly as I do. No, this is very true. So how do we get so lucky? Ooh, now this is the part of the story that I didn't really know a whole lot about, but yeah, found cut pretty to the soap opera. interesting. Yeah, this is the soap opera part. I would love to tell some of it. So there's this guy named James Smithson. He lived from 1765 to 1829. He was a British scientist. He left his estate to the U.S. to found at Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution and Establishment for the Increase and Diffusion of Knowledge. That's pretty vague. But he did indeed do it. On August 10th, 1846, the U.S. Senate passed the act organizing the Smithsonian Institution, which was signed into law by President James K. Polk. Cool. Mm -hmm. So this James Smithson guy, he's got an interesting backstory. I love his story so much. Yes. There has to be a book somewhere. Oh, probably. It's actually, it's probably too easy to write. It's like too good. You know what I mean? Like you would read it and be like, no chance. Yeah. Yeah. He was born in 1765. He was educated at Oxford. So... You know, smart guy. No big deal. He studied chemistry and mineralogy and became a notable amateur scientist. Good for I feel him. like if you go to Oxford, you're not an amateur, but <laughs> <laughs> who am I to say? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. That feels like... You could be an amateur a lot of things when you have a good education, probably. I, I mean, I would say that I'm an amateur, but my major wouldn't be that I studied chemistry and mineralogy. Mm, mm-hmm. Okay. He was the first to distinguish between zinc carbonate and zinc silicate. Not an amateur. Can you believe it? <laughs> Not an amateur. <laughs> he just distinguished in an amateur fashion, but he distinguished, I don't know. I, don't I know wish he you... wouldn't have gone above and beyond because I'm really feeling... Don't. 
no so aware to, of my amateur side. <laughs> amateur. <laughs> okay. He was an Ill- illegitimate child of a wealthy Englishman. Mm-hmm. You know, those illegitimate children can pose some challenges with the whole uh, money is, and inheritance this situation. This is where the daddy problems come this in. This is the daddy problem entering the scene. Okay. So his father was this wealthy Yorkshire baronet who became the Duke of Northumberland. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So his daddy's a duke. Uh-huh. His mother... Was a descendant of Henry the Seventh, <laughs> right? Just to keep it spicy, okay. Check so out. he's somehow related to the Tudor monarchy. He had no chance of inheriting his father's title, fortune, or dukedom because of that whole illegitimate mm-hmm. thing. That Oopsie poopsie! At the time of this guy's death, his estate was huge. It was like half a million dollars for that's. Uh, I mean, at that time, that was one sixty-sixth of the entire U.S. budget. So that's a lot of money. Like, to us, that, like, a lot, doesn't a lot strike us. I mean, it's a lot of money. I'm a teacher. Hello. Sure. But I don't know what that is in today's dollars, but it's it's a lot of money. He's very wealthy. A sixty-sixth of the U.S. entire federal budget. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder what the Lord. current U.S. federal budget is. I don't actually know. That's Wait. a good question. One moment. Oh! <laughs> Outlays is six point eight trillion, but the debt held by the public is twenty three trillion. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're we're talking. It's a lot of money. It, it's a lot of money. He's he's got a lot of money. So he has all this money. He receives an inheritance from his mother, a gazillion bajillion dollars with inflation. Uh, with inflation, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so he receives his inheritance from his mother. He decides he's going to leave all of his money to his illegitimate twenty year old nephew. Everybody's illegitimate here, I guess. When you said 20, I was like, that's young. And then I remembered that's like middle aged back then. Yeah, way back when. I mean, he's like nearly retired. Yeah. There's a stipulation, though, and that's that if this nephew dies childless, the fortune has to go toward what we talked about before this establishment Mm -hmm. for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. Okay. So James Smithson dies at 64 years old in 1829, three years after writing his will. His nephew died childless in 1935, meaning that the money had to go to the United States for the creation of this <laughs> establishment. This guy never set foot in America. No. He never set foot he in American soil. He just was like, ship it. He just was like, well, you know. You know what America needs. He's not wrong. There's a specula- There's some speculation about why he did this. I guess we're not really sure, though, according to the historical he, record. He didn't. There was no reason. None that anybody could find. There's speculation, though, that he wanted to perhaps deny his father's legacy. Which I like. daddy issues. Perhaps he just appreciated the U.S. experiment with democracy. Another option. Right. I, don't, I mean, I can appreciate the experiment, but I'm not leaving I don't think we're gonna get of their budget. I don't think we're going to get any more Smithsonian's anytime soon, because I'm not really sure anybody's too impressed with us at this current moment in our history. <laughs> he might have been inspired by the Royal Institution, which used scientific knowledge to improve human conditions, and I'm assuming that was in, the, in England at the time. He never wrote about or discussed his plans with anyone, as far as we can tell, and he is buried in the crypt on the first floor of the Smithsonian Castle. There are plans to build him a more permanent and complete memorial somewhere else. Yeah. Woof. So, the money that gets sent to the United States, uh-huh. right, causes... I. It's not like... I mean... The, it, the 166 of the budget yeah, that is... It calls some bequeathed. problems, uh-huh. as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Because the will is so vague that it's just like, ooh, do these lofty, you know, things. Increase human right. knowledge. It, Go for it. So, so our, what did he call it? The uh, experiment with democracy yes. looks at this money and is like... <laughs> They're like, hmm. Huh. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot of money to Let's, do. <laughs> we're going to experiment with that money. <laughs> so eventually, it was decided by a congressional act in 1846 that it'd be a private institution and trust to the U.S. government. And then with, uh, with that, they combined the later ideas for research centers, the observatory, libraries, and museums. So, in 1847, they laid the cornerstone for the castle. On this the is the mall. really pretty building on the mall. The big red it's, stone. It's the building on the mall that has no business being on the mall. Yeah, it doesn't look like it the rest of D.C. absolutely zero sense. It's well, beautiful. It is beautiful. And most buildings in D.C. are these ugly, brutalist, bleh, big yeah. blocks of white it's marble. It's like kind of a reddy orange kind of color. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? It's yeah. like, it's just, it's really beautiful. It is and it's pretty. So they started it in 1847 and they finished it and completed it in 1855. It was planned that Smithson's remains would be reinterred at the castle. And so in 1901, 
the U.S. is alerted that there's a disturbance to his grave because there is mining in the area. And so you want to take any guesses for who the uh, United States sent? Alexander Graham Bell went to Italy in 1903 and supervised his disinterment for him to be taken and then be buried at the castle, the Smithsonian his disinterment. Castle. disinterment. He was buried in Italy first? He was buried in Italy. How did he end up in Italy? Not sure. Okay. He just maybe got to Italy Maybe that somehow. nephew put him there? Oh, maybe. Okay. Okay. So Alexander Graham Bell goes to, Italy, to Italy to dig up this dead guy and to bring, him bring back the dead man to the country that he'd never been I to. If he ever met him, unless Alexander Graham Bell went to him, obviously. <laughs> I, I, I don't this know. This guy was landlocked. I don't know. Now okay. that you're saying it, that's well, a story. But he was disinterred from Italy and and then shipped here to the castle. So the only time that he Ugh. came to the United States is when he's dead. Okay. So he's there. Okay. Still okay. since 1905. Cool. And they've been thinking about making him something better for 170 years. <laughs> for the time years. being, he's just hanging out in the castle. <laughs> he gave us 66 of the budget, but we can't build him a mausoleum. He's hanging out, haunting his castle. Okay. We should have put him up on... Uh, <laughs> never mind. I'm just saying, we shouldn't be reinterring like people on the On top swamp, of the Washington you know? Monument? No. You want to put him up there? No, no, no. Where do you want to put him? <laughs> on top of the castle. Okay. Um, so, Alexander Graham Bell goes to Italy, supervises this, which, like... I don't know. I guess if I was, like, holding a shovel, I would probably listen to Alexander Graham Bell. Right? But sure. I mean, I'm just, in my head, I'm like, what is Alexander Graham Bell doing? I wonder if this was before or after he <sighs> was Anyways. rather famous for his own inventions. I don't know. So, way to go, Alex. So, over time... Okay, so Smithson's here. He's buried, right? Mm-hmm. Things are fine. Over time, the Smithsonian kept expanding and expanding, and today they're governed by a board of regents. That board consists of the U.S. Vice President, the mm-hmm. Chief Justice of the U.S., normal, three senators that have been appointed, three representatives who have been appointed, and nine U.S. citizens chosen by the board and approved by joint resolution of Congress. Hmm. Where do I apply? You know, <laughs> like, I, I know people can't see our notes, but my notes are in caps and highlighted teal, and it says, this is my dream. She wants to be appointed to the board because of the Smithsonian. it would be quicker for me to be appointed to the board than it would for me to become the vice president, the chief justice, a senator, or a rep. I don't know. I think you should hold out hope for the chief justice position. <gasps> oh, let me have it. Seems like be right up your alley. <laughs> Only my alley. You mean? So I'm going to say that I think we've we've done a pretty good job of preserving it. I'm pleased with the investment that they made. This uh, the Smithson, attempt at democracy. The Smithson family of illegitimate heirs. Yeah. The gift that they've given us. It's it's kind of beautiful that that's how we got it. Sure. I think. But that's how we got the Smithsonian. Mm-hmm. Isn't that great? I, I think like it's it. a fun story. It's a roller coaster. Many okay. twists and turns. So I read first about him, uh-huh. right, and his illegitimate issues. And I was like, okay. Sorry, they weren't illegitimate issues. <laughs> his illegitimate issues. <laughs> His, I don't mean his legitimate issues. His legitimate yeah. issues about being illegitimate. Y- yeah, yeah, very legitimate. <laughs> but I was reading it. <laughs> but as I was reading his story, I was like, "This is great." And then they threw in the nephew. I was yeah, like, "That's also too illegitimate. much. <laughs> too many illegitimate we people." Can't. We're just, we're just being a little bit, you know, one sixty-sixth illegitimate. <laughs> so. okay so smithson is here and he gave us the smithsonians and that's it goodbye goodbye so tell me about visiting these places because this is i think i feel like you want to get in the car right now and drive to the smithsonians i had any way i'd be out of here yeah i also want to say that my dad is a former member of the guild in dc and a tour guide so i get the guild what is the guild the the tour guide the guild i i know but not everyone not everyone Uh-oh. in the world knows what you I mean you're you questioning say, it i was like guild. hello <laughs> to you the guild in dc means something very specific to most people they <laughs> do not it, probably think it's like a cocktail bar or something uh, so yes he's a guild member. the guild <laughs> mm, he's a member of the guild he, i think he was i don't think he still is anyways my dad was a, a dc tour guide push guild member he was a guild member so he when he left teaching he retired and that's what he started doing so I get it. I get this very naturally. So visiting D.C., most of what I've pulled out here, these this next section is going to be about the mall in D.C. And if you're someone like my mother, I have really bad news. The mall is not a shopping place. 
I just, I have to put that out just there. Just to clarify. Because so many people have been like, I don't know. For all you shopping gals out why there. Why is the mall just all of these sad pieces of grass and <laughs> just, Yeah, the National know, Mall is not tour a shopping buses. mall. But there are tchotchkes. We love a tchotchke. I, I'm going to fangirl for a moment. I really can't put words how special these museums are. They are some of the most incredible museums I've ever seen. When you talk about like the docents and the historians that are involved in, at the Smithsonian, they're leaders of their fields. I will say right now, based on the research that I was doing for this, all of the museums are in a state of reopening. If you're planning to visit DC, I would just keep that in mind as you start thinking about what you want to do. Yeah, they're lifting COVID restrictions slowly but surely. They are lifting COVID restrictions, but they're also updating hours and things like that. So that's just something to think about when you when you yeah. decide to go. Check in before you go. Because their hours are changing. Some of them aren't open every day. Some of them, you know, so just take a gander. My personal opinion on visiting the museums... I would probably try to split these up into at least two days, maybe even three, just because of how large they are. Kate's like, plan your entire trip one day per museum. If you would like for me to give you a detailed itinerary to the (laughs) moment, I will do it. You can pay her and she'll become a guild member. Well, oh, I would in a minute. If I I had any business doing it, I would. But you definitely want to check the museums, their websites, because I still haven't been to the newest one on the mall. Mm -hmm. And every time we've been there, there have, there is still, like, there is a line outside to get into it. Yeah, we were going to go that one day. This is the African American -American, History and Culture Museum. Yeah, we were going to go there and it was, uh, you can't get in. We could see the line around. You can't get in. Yeah. I should say that was a while back that we were last here as well. But anyways, keep in mind, it's almost cherry blossom season. It is almost tour, like eighth grade tours, middle school tours, like you're going to be in the thick of it if you're there anytime in the next, I'd say three or four months. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. Also, if you decide you want to go to DC in like, I don't know, July, remember that it's a literal swamp. Okay. Yeah, it's hot and steamy. Oh, it's, it's just so gross. There's just... I worked in DC. So much moisture. I worked in DC for a summer and I used to come home at night and I have to crack the windows on my car because it would be so humid in DC that my car would get like just damp. <laughs> it would just smelling. Oh. It wasn't for me, I swear. I was doing no physical okay, exertion or sure. anything like that. My car would just smell Yeah, but walking damp in all DC is just yeah. like a workout. Yeah. Not because of anything other than just the heat. Yeah. Okay, so on the mall. This first list we're gonna go through are all are all within walking distance of each other. Now the yeah. mall is very large, so it's a long walk to some of them, but they are within walking distance. I'll let you go with the first one. Oh, my favorite. The mm-hmm. National Air and Space Museum. This museum has definitely has always been my favorite because I'm just a nerd about all this stuff. But it has so it great. holds, you know, spacesuits from famous astronauts and EVA activity. So, you know, we got we've got like, like the aliens? Yeah. Extra Are there aliens? Vehicular activities uh so like an suv an suv <laughs> for the moon a moon suv <laughs> uh no but they've got like you know space race suits john glenn suit that's a special one to us they've got a special exhibit on the cold on cold war aviation very interesting is the whole museum closing soon for renovations mm-hmm. yeah that's through like the fall we're gonna have to, to just ban travel to dc for that period of time they, for they're us, opening for no a couple of weeks and then they're closing sad yeah they had a new astronomy exhibit the last time we were there um that was really cool but just like you know they've got like mercury capsules they've mm-hmm. got rockets they've got aviation stuff just all sorts of stuff they it's do have my favorite they do have a lot of spacesuits yeah. i will say i was surprised by how many spacesuits pretty they sure had there. there's a chunk of the moon there yeah somewhere. there is you're right yeah there's a chunk of the moon out at the hangar too i'm pretty sure yeah i don't know if the rent of i don't it didn't say that the renovations included the hangar, but again, just check their websites. Yeah. Because it's literally changing like day by day right now. So that's my favorite. Why not? What's the What's the next one? You want to go ahead? Yeah. So the second one is the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It is the newest one. I don't even know how many times we've tried to get into there. Probably six times. You and I have just mm-hmm. swung by to see if it's possible. Has not been. All right. The must-see items there, they have Harriet Tubman's Hidnal. Oh, that's cool. They have a plantation cabin from South Carolina, and they have one of Michael Jackson's fedoras on display. Like I said, this is one we haven't been to, Mm -hmm. so we can't really add anything else that we saw, and that's just what the website is like. These are the must-see things, Mm -hmm. you know, so take that for what you will. I'm sure there's tons of other incredible things. I'm looking forward to hitting that one when, when the world is more normal again. I think it's maybe the prettiest of them. 
Mm-hmm. It's definitely the coolest looking building. From the outside. Yeah. The architecture it's is so neat. Very interesting. Okay, so the next one I have to talk about. Yes. It's my favorite. Oh, but of course. Okay, so the National Museum of American History. If you are going there, you have to see the Star Spangled Banner. You have to see Washington's uniform. They have Dorothy's red slippers. Um, oh, from the Wizard of Oz? Yep. That's, that's cool. one of the pairs. I think I remember seeing that. It. Okay, there are only, I think, three pairs of Dorothy's slippers. And those shoes, those red slippers, I'm pretty sure are called America's shoes because they're on display there. Okay. They're very small. America's shoes? They're not as shiny as I thought they would be. Well, well she's a tiny lady. Well, I know. I was just surprised. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Judy, right. didn't mean to offend you. Sorry, Judy. Um, I've been there more times than I can count. We've seen a couple cool Batmobiles there. I've seen Seinfeld's puffy shirt. We have seen Archie Bunker's chair, Oscar the Grouch, Apollo Ono skates. The last time I was there, they had an iPod on display, <laughs> and I about keeled over yeah, and you feel donated bit, my body to science because I was made like, you "Feel a bit old." No, <laughs> hey, they it still was, make them. They still make iPods. No, this was like the the, the, the iPod. Yes, it was not the one point like, oh. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I looked at it, and my dad was like, "Don't you have that?" And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "Moving on." <laughs> All right, next. My life is a museum piece. Yes, yeah, truly. The next one is the National Museum of the American Indian. I think I have been to this one, but this it's one's been neat. It, it's really cool, but it's been a really long time. It's so really beautiful I was inside. Young when we first went, yeah, but we should go back here the, to mm-hmm. the next time. I like go, this but. one. I like um, them all, but I like this. one. The exhibits here feature treaties between the U.S. and American Indian nations and a piece of native place Algonquin peoples of the Chesapeake. That sounds pretty interesting. I know. I'm interested in that one as well. Yeah. Is that a temporary exhibit? Do you know yeah. or that one's permanent? It didn't. I can't tell how temporary anything is right now, though, because yeah. I can't tell if it was out before. You and I mean, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I can't, I really can't tell what's, what's going to be there. I got um, you. As they're all in their states of reopening. And then the last one that we'll talk about on the mall is a museum of natural history. And I like this one. I like looking at all Oh, it's great. Old rocks. Yeah, it's the world's most popular national history museum. Huh. The coolest thing that I've seen there was the Hope Diamond. Mm. I thought that was so neat to see. Interesting. I like the mummies. Yeah, Egyptology is cool. Yeah, and then they have tons of fossils, obviously. And their website was like, come for the daily tarantula feedings. And I could not <laughs> care about that list. Come for but the they daily were tarantula excited. feedings. And I respect that. Also, I don't know if I told this story, but I once spent an entire day staking out the Museum of Natural History in D.C. trying to find Betty White. Yeah. I don't remember if I told it on the podcast or not. I don't. But, I can't remember. But I did. I was there with my dad on a tour, and my students loved it. I had eighth graders with me at the time, and of course, they were all about natural history. Middle school kids eat this stuff up because there's so many things to see. I mean, rocks and fossils are cool. Yeah. I'm just saying. But for me, <laughs> Betty White was doing an event that night for one of her... Like her animal yeah, it was, advocacy Yeah, things. it was one of those. And so she was the speaker. And so they like kept closing off parts of it and setting up for it. And I just kept sitting there, like waiting for her. And everyone was like, we have to go. Anyways. Oh, Betty. Oh, Betty. So the other DC collections, though. Yes. So these are other famous and important Smithsonian's. Mm-hmm. They're just not located on the mall. Yeah. So they're just not as easily... Well, I don't want to say that they're easily accessible. It's just not the convenience of the mall, yes. is what I would say. We've been to the, the first one. I love the it. National Portrait Gallery. Yeah. It's really neat. One of my faves. It's the nation's only complete collection of presidential portraits outside of the White House. And this includes the the Obama portraits that you and I saw when mm. we went a couple of years ago. Really interesting pieces of art, oh, I think. So beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And they definitely break the mold um, when you compare them to yeah, the other presidential portraits. They really do. You can tell that the Obamas are just doing something different there. Oh, that Michelle Obama piece is just... It's very interesting. We also saw... I got a great picture of Chelsea there. I'll just see if I can find it to post it, actually. with uh, Remember that the portrait of Steven Spielberg mm-hmm. that you posed beside? Mm-hmm. The National Portrait Gallery is always changing what they have out. So I would definitely check ahead if you're looking for a specific piece. When we were there, they also had out the portrait of all of the, at at the time, the living female justices from the Supreme Court. And that was really neat. And that was really special to see as well. So just, gosh, it's such a cool building too. I just love it there. Last one. Mm -hmm. The zoo. 
The National I, Zoo. I've never been here. So I lived. Are you serious? I, I lived. Oh, it's so good. Like 45 minutes away from downtown DC, like for eight years of my life, and somehow never made it to the National Zoo. I'm actually surprised. Y- yeah. I also never made it to the Baltimore Aquarium, which is another one that's really fun. Is it good? Fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've heard it's very good, but I never, never made it for some reason. So up until COVID, the zoo was famously open 364 days a year. But. They that, closed on Christmas? They did. That's cute. But that's all changed, obviously, because of COVID. According to the website, they were planning on reopening seven days a week on March 14th. So if you're planning on going, I would double check, like I said every time. But that's what they said. Cool. Oh, uh, that's this week. So the National Zoo sits on 163 acres in DC's Rock Creek Park. And the things you have to see, they have more than 2,700 animals. They have Asian elephants, but most famously, they have the giant pandas. I just remember that being really big when they opened with that exhibit. And hmm. they still have the pandas there. Interesting. So it's a, it's, a really, it's a really neat zoo because it just feels like a walk that you're on where animals just happen to be part of it. Pretty sure that the, those pandas are the ones in question in that West Wing episode when they're talking about the yes, mailing. Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> so. Big deal, the pandas. So, National Zoo, it's beautiful. And it was really cool. I was there around Christmas time, and I went in the evening, and it was just, it was really beautiful. So, a cool. big fan. Yeah. So, in recent news for the Smithsonian, in December of 2020, Congress passed a new legislation that established two new museums that would be coming. The first one is the National Museum of the American Latino, and the second one is the American Women's History Museum. Ooh. They're in the early, early, early stages for both, obviously, because that was December of 2020. It's interesting to think of it as an institution that's still growing and expanding, though. Because yeah. I just, I've always thought of the Smithsonian's as like, I mean, just like establishments, you yeah. know? Like, like they've just, been just there. as a kid, it was just like a thing that everybody went to go see in Washington. Yeah. And it's kind of fun to think of it as this, this living and evolving cool. institution. And I think that's what was so exciting about the African American one yeah. when it opened was yeah. that there hadn't been one for so long. It's probably why there are still lines around the block, too. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, that legislation was in late December of 2020. Early stages for both, no word yet on location. I am just going to say, in my very professional opinion, I don't know where on the mall they would go, but oh yeah, who am I to say? I really don't think that they're going to go on the mall. There's not much room left on the mall. I just don't think DC is going to change the composition of the mall at this point. They kind of did with the African American, though. That's, yeah. that's the only one that sits on the inside. Yeah, you're right. Because it, it does... I was surprised by its location. So we'll see. I'm I'm excited for that. I have no idea what... A timeline is like for opening a, a new Smithsonian. Smithsonian. I yeah. can't imagine. I'm sure it'll be years from now. But I think both of those will be a nice addition. Cool. So other than just just being an opportunity for me to be excited about museums, I thought I'd wrap it up with some information for teachers. So the Smithsonian, I just went through their website. They have a huge YouTube channel mm-hmm. with tons of awesome videos on it. They have a magazine and I think that one of the things I read said that educators can get it for free. I think you probably just have to show. Smithsonian Magazine? Yeah. Okay. Their, their magazine. It's called the Smithsonian Magazine. Mm-hmm. They have multiple podcasts. They have resources for educators. They have professional development opportunities. They have events for students, families, and teachers. And if you're local or can travel, they have field trips. A one-stop shop. But their website was really helpful. And I, I was looking at their professional development just because I was interested in, mm-hmm. in what they had. Uh, most of it right now seems to still be virtual. Yeah. But it looked like... That's based, probably true of most federally funded Yeah. It looked like based right on now. their website, though, that there were in-person opportunities, but it seemed that you would pick the specific museum that, you know what I mean, sort of fit whatever sort of field you're in. Hmm. So I'm, I'm curious to keep an eye on that just for myself, just because I would like to do a PD with them, I think. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, their their YouTube was incredible. I've I've had a subscription of their magazine before, and it's so interesting. And I haven't listened to their podcast, but I actually added a couple, um, and they have quite a few, all kinds of things that teachers can be. I yeah, me too. Go sign up for all of those. Subscribe. So, Lots of resources and support for educators, and I'm sure that there's only going to be more of a now that they're reopening Mm -hmm. and have more consistent hours and things like that. The last thing about them, though, is that, and this could change, but they used to close like like 4 p.m., so they're not open. You know, like you kind of have to get there in the early day, midday for them. They're not like an evening activity if you're trying to visit them. It's definitely one of the first couple things you'll do, but yeah, still great. Cool. Okay, so... Fill in the blank. 
fill in the blank. You want me to do last episodes? Yeah. This is where we ask you a trivia question and you write into us hello at 16 to onecom All spelled out, all of the letters. If you write into us, tell us the answer, we will send you a sticker from the show. Or if you just tell us you want a sticker. Yeah, if you we'll just tell us you want a sticker, we'll give you a sticker. We've got piles of stickers. People have been asking for stickers and we got it. We got it. Yeah. Mostly local requests so far, so I don't I don't feel quite as much shame at not at not sending them. But listen, if you're there and you're very far away, let us know. We'll send you a sticker. And my coworkers and friends, I promise I I will bring you stickers. <laughs> I just keep forgetting. If you hear this and I still haven't, just text me. Just text her. Because I, I have a pile and they're ready. I just I have to get them in the car to go just with me. Just shame her into doing it. <laughs> All right. Why don't you give us last episode's question? Okay. The question was, which famous Roman god of war was March named after? Mars. Mm, Mars. 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 Go figure wasn't maybe the strongest question we could have asked, but it's a good one. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta throw away. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, this one is a little more uh, in depth this week, I guess I would say. I did know this one though. You did. I did know this one. Yeah. Yeah. This one is uh, this episode's question. In 1995, the National Air and Space Museum dealt with controversy surrounding the display of the super fortress used by the U.S. to drop the first atomic bomb in World War II. Multiple groups believe the exhibit put forward only one side of the debate concerning the atomic bombings, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What was the name of that historic Boeing B-29 superfortress? That's a big, that's a big Boeing. It's, uh, yes, it's large. And the answer of this is something that I've stored away in my head for trivia, because it comes up a lot in the trivia groups I've been in. I don't remember this particular bit of controversy, but I'm sure, I'm sure it was We were, I mean, we were so young when that would have been a controversy. Anyways. Yeah. So what was the name of that historic Boeing B-29? Yep. Okay. All right. What'd you learn this week? I have a couple of things I'm going to share. Have at it. I, I'm going to include the link. We watch a TikTok. As we do. I know. You know, I like hear my students and they're like, oh, I heard it on TikTok. And I'm like, well, you shouldn't believe it. And then I'm like, listeners, guess what I learned? I heard it on TikTok. So I understand the irony. So there is a tradition of film directors sending congratulations to other directors when they break their box office records. And so this TikTok we watched was of Star Wars and like that Titanic and like all of these directors sending incredible art, mashing up the different movies like E.T. and Jaws and stuff like that. It's like, it's like um, custom, they're custom art. It's like, yeah, it's really cool. They've they're, had it specifically done yeah. in the, for the point, for the purpose of sending it to the director who has beat their record. What I liked about it is that it's, it's kind of its own art form. It's really yeah. cool because whoever the, you know, the director is who's handing off the baton mm-hmm. goes to some effort to make really neat art boards that are also yeah. congratulatory notes yeah. it's just a really interesting thing and we'll, we'll and link to it but it's cool a couple of them that we watched of course it was like george lucas but they would write like really clever things in the cards to each other mm-hmm. about the movies mm-hmm. and like what they you know so it was just really fun and it, i think it was so much fun because we were watching movies that we grew up with of those directors who was sending them mm-hmm. back and forth so it was just really neat and i uh i wish that we like knew what those were now yeah like i wish that you know because like it's just kind of something that happens but i I would just love to see the more recent stuff the behind the scenes yeah yeah so the other thing i learned i'm just now listening to barack obama's most recent book Mm -hmm. it's a great book for a drive i will say the bit that i was listening to most recently was talking about his 2009 nobel peace prize Mm -hmm. and so he said that he and michelle were getting ready to go to like the fancy you know events of the night and someone came in and told him to look outside of their hotel so he's he's like you know of course i'm listening to the audiobook so it's like i'm just having a private conversation with former president obama but he he tells the story that when they looked outside there were more than four thousand people standing outside of his hotel holding up candles and so it is a tradition that has been going on for some time now where the these people will go out and support the most recent Nobel Peace Prize winner. Mm-hmm. And they show their support by just crowding the streets with candles wow. as a way to like show their respect 
and their support for the choice. That'd be cool to see. And so here is President Obama talking about 4,000 people just holding candles, standing outside, and like kind of the moment that he had when he saw that, because he didn't know that was a thing that they did. Mm-hmm. So he was completely shocked he's when like, he... what's going on here? Yeah, he looked outside and he's like, there's just 4,000 people holding candles, like, <laughs> you know, and so I'm sure that for most presidents, that's like not a welcome scene. Like, that's probably kind of iffy for a lot of, so you know, secret service. Torches um, and pitchforks. But it's something that they do... As a celebration of the person who's been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. That's very cool. I just thought that was really neat. That's I don't a neat know. Tradition. It made me feel good. I had no idea. Yeah, I, I had no idea either. But yeah, it was just it was just kind of a neat little story that he told as part of... It was just... You could tell he was just touched, you know? Mm-hmm. It was a special thing. Mm-hmm. That's neat. It's kind of cool. Very cool. What about you? I learned a lot of things that are kind of just like boring with work. I'm just picking up some new tech sacks and stuff just because it's fun and that's when I'm having... My moments of professional fulfillment are usually around when I get to learn a new thing. So that's yeah. just, just... That does bring you great joy. General web development stuff happening. So that's fun. But uh-huh. also another big thing that I suppose I learned how to do, although I, it's an ongoing learning thing. I uh, I had my first session of my very own D&D campaign, you Dungeons did. & Dragons. You did great. I am, I am now a DM mm-hmm. of that very nerdy master. game. I'm a dungeon master. Yeah. It's true. It's true. It it's full fun. send on the nerdiness. I'm just embracing it. I think you it. were already there. Don't think this was the tipping point. Yeah. So the thing about it for me is that I just love exercising my creativity in that kind of way. And also I was 3D printing a whole bunch of minis for it. That's actually what the, very fun the drive too. is about. Well, I already painted them. I just like, you know, I wanted to go all in. So I'm printing the enemies we're going to fight and printing some of the good guys too. Mm-hmm. So I got to use my artistry, my craftiness. I got to do a lot of writing. I'm trying to come up with, you know, character arcs and narratives and and locations and challenges and puzzles you and did a it's great just, job. yeah my brain loves working in a million different directions like that mm-hmm. all at once and doing improv on the spot as well so i'm not super confident in those abilities yet but it sure is a fun thing to do and it's a fun group of people that we hang out with and play with so yeah i'm still learning that's yeah, what i'm learning it's good though I'm trying to think of other things we're watching the marvelous mrs mazel yeah we love season. mrs mazel which it's is a very a, funny show Creation from Amy Sherman Palladino, mm-hmm. who did Gilmore Girls, which is my favorite show of all time. This is Maisel. It's good stuff. Yes. We're still enjoying the Gilded Age. Yep. I'm sure we've talked the about Julian that. The Fellow show. Yep. I'm still enjoying I enjoy that. Haven't done much else. I've just been working a lot. I think those are the highlights, I've, really. I felt a new burst of mental energy after having COVID and surviving yeah. it and getting through it. And uh, I feel like my brain has been kicking back into, into normal yeah. gear. So I've tried to be... I've been trying to be productive. I made the rookie mistake of having all of my classes have a test or a presentation in the same week. So I'm transitioning out of Come all on, of teach. my units. What are you doing? And transitioning into units at the same time. And usually I'm much better at it to not do that. So I'm not really doing great, if you're wondering. So everybody, send Kate a care package. <laughs> Please. Just course like. Hello um, at 16to1.com, your letters of admiration, support in this difficult time while Kate gets accept. through all of her units at the same time. Other things worth mentioning? Got a new book, but I didn't start it, so I'm not going to plug it just in case. Should probably start reading the pile of books that's taking over the couch. The other night I looked over at Kate's end table by her side of the couch and it's just, there's no room to put anything on I, it anymore because it's completely covered in so books. I have placed my books in a shape that allows me to still have a cup holder. Just, there's one coaster there's worth a of coaster, space. There's a coaster, yeah. One coaster so worth of space. it's secure. Nothing's getting wet. Uh-huh. It's very protected. All the cat the- doesn't like it because she can't jump up on the couch that way anymore. I kind of like it for that reason. I mean, so Other things, just keeping an eye on things in the Ukraine. Yeah, things are still bad in Ukraine. So keep giving, if you can, financially support mm-hmm. various humanitarian organizations. If you can... That's great. If you can't, you can still make sure that you're you're reading and keeping up on what's happening and just being, you know, aware of the situation. I Is think this that's the huge temptation right now. to be an armchair expert on a global geopolitical situation that doesn't really need your strong Twitter opinion. Sure. Maybe. But I think it is important to be reading and to be learning and to be yes. informed of Always what's happening. Be learning and listening, um, especially to Ukrainian voices. So yeah. Anything else? Just taking care of yourself, getting some nice weather. 
Yes. Go for some walks. We're about to be out in the garden again. I'm so we excited. We are. It's time to start planting. Yes. I think it's we're time to get probably our... already like a week behind on some things. Yes. It's time to get our dog in shape. It's definitely time to get the dog in shape. Time to get ourselves in she- shape. So anyways, just try to enjoy some time outside unless you're in Ohio and you just had more snow. And we'll see you soon. We'll talk to you in two weeks. Okay, bye. 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 Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. Every day is an opportunity for the Ohio legislature to do (laughs) something that makes my blood boil. I think we need a new opening. Oh, we do? (laughs) Hello! (laughs) Hello!